It's a great pleasure to have with us this evening our speaker, Michaela Popper-Wyatt. Michaela has, is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Manchester. She's held postdoctoral appointments in Berlin as a Marie Curie Fellow and at Birmingham and in Barcelona. Her work covers a broad range of areas, the philosophy of language and the philosophy of linguistics, meta-ethics, social and political philosophy, social epistemology, and other things. And she's published on all those areas, uh, including recently some work on hate speech online. And this evening, her talk will be entitled, How Hate Speech Works. Michaela, over to you. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for making the time. Uh, so, I'm just going to uh, start uh, by talking about the problem of hate speech, and in particular, oppressive speech. Um, so, before I start, I want to uh, raise a trigger warning, uh, given the type of uh, language that we're going to uh, be addressing. So, I'm going to put on the slide some very offensive words. I'm not going to verbalize them. So I'm going to refer to it with the N-word or C-word or things like that. And I will ask you in Q&A to avoid um, using those words, uh, just to avoid um, causing offense. So let me start by talking about the problem. Uh, and there is certainly um, a, a problem of poli with politeness, politeness and civility online. And that includes, but is not limited to hate speech. It is certainly possible to... Uh, for anyone to send to anyone else messages online that express feelings of hatred. But restricting uh, all such speech would require a law uh, imposing civility. And while well, country, some countries have uh, this kind of laws, criminalizing of, uh, insults, I, in particular Germany, I think that might be a step too far. Um, but the problem that we are concerned with tonight, oops, <laughs> probably, is, oops, um, is, is more specific than insult. What we are concerned with tonight is hate speech, and in particular, a kind of hate speech that is addressed to oppressed groups. And the question is, why oppressed groups? Um, and the answer is because hate speech directed towards oppressed groups, as opposed to powerful groups, are part of a system of oppression. But hate speech is not evenly uh, spread, uh, so to understand how unevenly uh, hate speech is. Uh, let's look at this clip from um, uh, Diane Abbott MP during a parliamentary meeting on hate speech uh, uh, di di like directed towards MPs following the murder of uh, Joe Cox MP by a far-right uh, terrorist. Has been characteristically racist and sexist. And just to outline, I've had death threats. I've had people tweeting that I should be hung if, quote, they could find a tree big enough to take the fat bitch's weight. There was an EDL-affiliated Twitter account, hashtag burn Diane Abbott. I've had rape vets described as a pathetic, useless, fat, black piece of shit, ugly, fat, black bitch. And over and over again. And one of my members of staff said that when people ask her what is the most surprising thing about coming to work for me, the most surprising thing for her is how often she has to read the word So, as you can hear, it's pretty horrific just even kind of hearing the experience that she, she, she's going through and the people working with her. But the question arises, is it really a coincidence that people wishing to threaten her chose to use racial and gender terms? I don't think so. Is it surprising that the proposed actions resemble images from a lynching or acts of sexual violence? I don't think so. So the choice is made because oppressive speech supercharges hate. It draws on an entire power of historical oppression and violent oppression of women and black people. So Diane Abbott um, at one point received half of all the hate male uh, received in parliament. So first, hate speech is a problem because it is used to oppress it is a linguistic tool, part of a system of oppression. It's a mechanism of social control, if you will. Now, the second problem is that social media allows its uh, more sp rapid spread and widespread, than, uh, and this re has recently caused an upsurge. Here's a graph uh, of uses of the N-word day by day uh, during the end of last October. And you can see 
uh, in the last day of the sequence, a five-fold increase. Um, would you guess what the cause was? The? Yeah, exactly, yes, indeed. So the, the answer is that's the day when Elon Musk completed his $44 million buyout of Twitter. So the race it uses decided to test the boundaries the very first day, even before he stepped in through the door. And finally, hate speech is also a problem because it has indirect physical consequences. So following a notorious article by Boris Johnson, where he describes Muslim women's women as letterboxes, you can see an anti-Muslim attacks that rose 375%. And this is a well-known phenomenon. It is well known that physical attacks, attacks on mosques, attack on uh, uh, Muslim women, all of these things increase during periods after a politician or a celebrity says something inflammatory. So hate speech uses images of violence and it begets physical violence. And these words have both physical and socio-psychological effects. And that is a deliberate choice. It is one of its main purposes. Now, that we are agreed on the data that uh, about hate speech as a source of oppressive violence, you may wonder, what help, if any, can a philosopher bring? It doesn't seem very obvious that philosophy would have anything very useful to say on the problem. But, well, in fact, philosophers do have a lot to say. And hate speech raises many interesting puzzles for philosophy. And I will argue, however, that the interest should not just flow one way. Uh, if we describe accurately the root of the mechanism, we are better informed as to how to stop or reduce um, its spread. So let's us start by thinking about um, what issues hate speech raises for philosophy of language and our view of what language is for, how it works to convey meaning. And to fully understand that, um, we need to first know a few couple, a couple of ideas from philosophy of language. So the view that philosophers of language had kind of dominated uh, for a long time was that language is about information exchange. This information can concern events that happen to you, plans for the future, or descriptions of places and people, or more abstract notions like the, uh, the things that you have learned or expression of your own ideas and feelings. And this is how I'm using language now. Or you can also ask questions, raise objections, or put forward hypotheses, as, as we sh shall do together later on. But language isn't purely about information. You can also change the physical world through language. So in the 1950s, uh, the English philosopher J.L. Austin introduced the idea of speech acts. So a speech act is an utterance that we make to perform an action in the world. It's a way of doing things with words that changes something physical or social in the world, directly or indirectly. Um, so for example, in a famous example from uh, the philosopher John Searle, uh, who introduced this idea of indirect speech acts. So one person here, one panda, um, he, uh, he says to another panda, can you pass the salt in their panda language? So a perfectly logical reply would be, yes, I can. I have the ability, but that reply wouldn't be really helpful. So the request is not meant to elicit information about the abilities, but rather to do something, to do an action, to change the location of the salt from one, one panda to another panda. So the speech indirectly changes the physical world by making a request um, for physical action. But as Austin uh, himself pointed out, speech acts don't change the world uh, only indirectly by prompting a physical act. A piece of speech can, by convention, change the legal and social status of people. For example, and this is from like when uh, um, the four, uh, four weddings and a funeral, and, and uh, Robin, uh, he's making a little bit of a hash of his, his duty as a vicar, but nevertheless, he manages to get to the end and says, I hereby declare you man and wife. So when he's saying that, uh, he is performing an act that changes the legal status of the two individuals. Before saying that, they weren't married, and after that kind of uh, statement, uh, um, saying you are now man and wife, it changes the social, one of the social roles. Um, uh, it, it forces a change upon the world, in a sense. Uh, and philosophers like Austin would like to say that by saying so, we make it so. We change reality via the words that we use. 
And it does so in a particular form that is important for my argument. So it changes one of the social roles that each person has, that of their marital status. And social roles are important um, aspects of our lives. Uh, the change, uh, how we behave in certain circumstances. Uh, we all have multiple social roles that we'll fulfill, and each social role carries with it, uh, with it expect expectation as to how we are to behave. Uh, for example, we have different expectations of uh, the behavior of a patient than we do of a doctor in a hospital, or a teacher and a pupil. So each person has quite a different role to play in a particular social interactions. But it is also the case that one person will fill many different social roles during a single day, and that affects how they, uh, how they behave and how they are expected to behave by the people with whom they're interacting. For example, if the teacher is a mother, uh, she will be expected to behave, to interact differently with her own children than with the children that she's teaching. So these roles are social roles that we feel each day and are incredibly powerful sharpers of, of our behavior and the predictions that we can make about how the interaction will go on. So these two very different concepts of speech acts that change the world and the social roles, on the other hand, will come together in, uh, later in the talk to answer the question that I'm now uh, going to examine. And this concerns a particular kind of speech, uh, of hate speech, that we call slurs. So, in, remember, in Diana Abbott's uh, speech early on, she mentioned the N-word. And this is a, a type of hate speech. Uh, in particular, it's this kind of uh, what we call a slur. So a slur is a, is a word that refers, although not always in a derogatory fashion, to an individual or individuals on the basis of their group membership, and typically nothing else. So here, a membership of a, of a particular race or ethnic group, or you might think of gender or sexual preferences and things like that. Now, if the view that language is just about information exchange uh, were true, then the meaning of the word would be equivalent, according to some philosophers, to one of the meanings of the word black. Uh, so call that a neutral counterpart. But clearly, the N-word and the, the word black really have completely different effects. On one hand, you are able to convey hatred, and with the word black, uh, perhaps you, you don't. Uh, unless you kind of infuse a certain contempt or other, other kind of additional, additional things. So here is one problem that slurs pose for philosophers who believe that a word is defined by its meaning and that meaning is, um, and that the meaning of both these words is merely the group intended to be referred to by that, by, by that word. So you need something else. You need kind of to add some sort of other components of meaning like expression of contempt or, or contempt or other negative attitudes that you might express. Or you might need to add something that you do with the words in addition to the, to the very meaning. So slurs are puzzling also from another point of view. And empirically, lots of words are slur words. Um, for example, young to refer to Americans, or limey to British, Aussies to Australian. And these are not generally viewed as being very offensive. And one reason is perhaps because they're directed to, towards uh, powerful groups. Another reason is that also words may evolve uh, over time, so that, for example, the word Bosch was very, a very powerful slur, uh, but now it has lost its derogatory power. So, Given this variety of slur words, we can categorize tens or hundreds of slurs according to how offensive people find them. And Ofcom did just as this. Uh, here are the results. Um, just take a moment to, 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 to read them. There are kind of many, many words that I, I wish to kind of use. So, and then in a way, what, what matters is that they categorize them uh, by the degree of their offense. So, so some words are considered inoffensive, like those on the left. Uh, some are more moderately offensive, like those in the middle. And others are likely to cause uh, a significant or profound offense, like those on the right. So there is this kind of spectrum of, of slurs and the uh, sort of not all slurs are equal. Um, and this is what something we call um, variable offense. So in fact, there are, there are three kinds of, um, of variable offense, uh, namely um, like slurring, 
uh, can vary. Uh, they can vary in their offense depending on the words that is used. So you can we can think that some some slur words for some groups are more offensive than slurs for other groups. Or you may think that the that all the variety of slurs for one group, some are more offensive than others. So that's a sort of a, a word variation. A second type of variation depends on the context, the sort of how you use the, the slur word. So you may have uses uh, like in-group, and in that case, you sort of, uh, what, it's what we know, we, we would call appropriation or reclamation. People that just use it with a positive kind of intent to, as, as a signal of empowerment and things like that, or solidarity. Um, so context will tell you when and, and how offensive a word um, is. And you may also have a, a variation in offense according to the audience. So uh, some people may find may be very offended by the use of a, of a particular slur word, whereas others will be uh, will not be offended. So different different theories of linguistic meaning try to explain how this variable offense came about. And my answer is that um, it is it is all have to do with power differentials. So the oppressive slurs, the one on the right that are um, very kind of cause a very profound um, uh, offense or harm. Um, so those are, as you not, uh, as you as you kind of noted, they are referring to groups that at one time or another have been or are still oppressed groups, and that is no coincidence. So in a sense, slurs are all about power, and their use is about trying to grab power. Now. If you think about slurs and hate speech in terms of power and oppression, this categorization starts to make sense. So being a member of an oppressed group can place us, depending on the circumstance, in a low power social role, in a role in which you are subordinate to some others. And being in a particular social role also determines how you are treated in a social interaction, such as a conversation. And it is also the case that our social role can change during a conversation. And to see, to see this, I want to show you three clips from a movie called In the Heat of the Night. Um, I hope you all have seen it. <laughs> if not, go and see it. Um, so the, the kind of background for this movie is that a character played by Sidney Poitier has been arrested on suspicion of murder in a small town in Mississippi in the middle of the 60s, and now he's interrogated by the sheriff. So, and, and, and just pay attention to the kind of, the, the roles that kind of come in salience in their conversation and the way that changes the relationship between the two interlocutors. So here we start. Don't you worry about him. Got a name, boy? Virgil Tibbs. Virgil. <laughs> well, I don't think we're going to have any trouble, are we, Virgil? No trouble at all. Oh, you can go now, Sam. Yes, sir. Meanwhile, you just killed yourself a white man, just about the most important white man we got around here, and picked yourself up a couple of hundred dollars. I earned that money, 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Colored can't earn that kind of money. Boy, hell, that's more than I make in a month. Now, where did you earn it? Philadelphia. Mississippi? Pennsylvania. Now, just what do you do up there, little old Pennsylvania, earn that kind of money? I'm a police officer. So, his role of being a police officer is part of his long-term social role but is not yet relevant or salient in the conversation until he really uses the words i am a police officer and she shows the he, he shows the badge and this is when a social role that you have outside of a conversation becomes salient and does some work to change the dynamics and the relationships with with the with your interlocutor now, being on an equal foot, both are policemen, then we kind of move from the power imbalance that we started with to a sort of more equal power balance. And finally, after he finds out that he's a very, uh, an expert in... Well, now, you were the, the number one homicide expert. That's right. Boy, 
I bet you get to look at a lot of dead bodies, don't you? Lots. Well? Well, what? Well, I, no, I just thought maybe, uh, maybe you wouldn't mind taking a look at this one. No, thanks. Well, why not, expert? Because I've got a train to catch. Oh, wait a minute. That train don't leave to 12 o'clock noon. Look, they pay you $162.39 a week just to look at bodies. Why can't you look at this one? Why can't you look at it for yourself? Because I'm not an expert. Officer. So finally, we end the conversation with a, even a sort of a deferential role where he, he acknowledges that he's an expert and refers to him with a, with, a, with a norific. So what we saw, we have this kind of transition in the power balance between the two characters, depending on the, the roles that they take on in the conversation that become kind of salient, and then they kind of come in and out of the conversation and that they alter the the power dynamics in the conversation. So that shows us that atrocities can change the power in the, in the, in the social interactions in, in very remarkable ways. And this is what I think slurs do. Slurs work on a similar pattern. At least that's my contention. So they grab power from the target of the slur. The target not only feels attacked, but they feel as if the freedoms that they had in conversation have been curtailed. And this is the whole point to subordinate, to silence. Um, and how is this slur doing that? I believe it is working by assigning a role, a sort of a conversational role, using a speech act that changes the rules of the dialogue. The speaker takes on a dominant role in virtue of their group membership, being a white or being a man. And then you assign, as a speaker, uh, a target, uh, you assign the target a low power role or a subordinate role. And that alters the, the power dynamics in the conversation by changing the rules of the game. Who gets to do uh, what one is told? And under the new rules, the target has no power in the conversation. Uh, what they say is of a low value. They can be silenced, they can be ignored, or what they say is treated with contempt. And that's a form of exercising power within the limits and for the duration of that conversation. And if you've ever been placed in a, power, uh, in a low power role by someone in a social situation, you'll know what it feels like in the moment it happens. Now, uh, how might they do this? What's the mechanism? And to answer this, we need one more concept uh, that will later prove to be very general and very powerful. And this is the notion of games, more specifically, conversational game. And this is where we bring in the philosopher David Lewis, who has this idea that conversations are like games like a sport. You have a score or a kind, of, kind of a record that keeps track of all the moves at any one time. And the score can include rules that govern the specific conversational game, and both can be altered by utterances. And these are the moves that we make in a, in a game. But Lewis um, primarily wanted to highlight how the score updates what is done with words, namely enabling to alter what's appropriate to do next. So the key idea here is his idea of accommodation, which enables the score to update, to adjust, to make the moves that have been made count as correct play yeah, within the, the, the rules of the game. Now, I want to move on um, a little bit um, from, from language for a bit. So, because we don't just participate in conversational games, but in many different social um, games. So each of us through our lives going from one place to place, uh, and at each place we have social interactions. Uh, in each social interactions, even if we have very limited interactions, there are always ways that we are expected to behave and ways we can behave that are totally unexpected. So unexpected behavior um, may lead to approval or disapproval, but the mere fact that behavior is unexpected tells us that there are expectations. So, but these games are not just about behavior, but about the purpose of behavior, which is to achieve some social or physical reward. So humans characteristically cooperate to achieve goals and rewards. For example, the earliest hun uh, kind of human societies involved um, uh, cooperative hunting. Interestingly, early hunting societies we know divided gains equally. But when hum humans started to settle in an agrarian or, and then uh, urbanized, this changed. 
and the rewards of labor become, became distributed in unequal ways. And this leads me to another strand of my work, which is trying to explain using the idea of gains, uh, why there is inequality in the distribution of the rewards of joint labor. And uh, whether these unequal distributions uh, of rewards can become locked in uh, by group membership so that we can think of the game, um, the social game as being in a sense an oppressive games in which members of one group systematically get less than members than another group. So for this we use a well-known competitive bargaining game. Uh, we call it the, the Nash demand game or think of it as divide a pie. Um, so here two individuals are uh, bargaining for how to divide some sort of resource, yeah, the, the pie. They bid for how much they want. Yeah? And if the total of their bids amount to the available resource, they get what they bid. All good. But if the bids exceed the available resource, say both pushed a little bit too aggressively or um, the bargaining breaks down and both get a baseline uh, payoff, which you call disagreement point. Uh, so now, if my disagreement point uh, as a player in a game is higher than yours, I have an advantage because I have more resource to fall back uh, than you. So I stand, I stand to lose less if we can't agree a deal. And this gives me a bargaining advantage, which I can exploit in future interactions to get more of the resource, more pie. And here is a diagram that represents how the game uh, stabilizes uh, in, in kind of three possible equilibria, or we call them norms, in the sense that players are not incentivized to change. They, uh, they're just kind of stuck in that. So one equilibrium is fair. So here we kind of, uh, we have player one and player two making different moves. So you can imagine just as a generic way of kind of saying, I make, I make a low bid and you make a high bid, where we can make kind of a medium bid and we kind of agree in the middle. So we play this, uh, this will be, the, this will be the, the first player here, can make low bid or five or like the medium or H. The other player, will, will his, his payoffs will be here. And so what you see that we're, we're, where we stabilize is this blue squares. So we stabilize either in the middle, um, we kind of reach a sort of agreement to kind of divide the, the, the resources equally. Uh, and that's an, a, a fair equilibrium, a fair norm, as it were. But you also have these two extremes, uh, high and low, or low and, and high. So those are the unfair equilibria, the unfair norms where it kind of we, we, we stabilize. And then, so that's one way that the players, two players, can play the game. But if you then extend this game and make it um, kind of uh, Two, two groups of agents, yeah? You have a population, you divide it into groups, and you make the agents play one against the other, first against the agents of the opponent group, and then with agents of your own group, and you let them play many, many, many interactions, like over generations, and then basically the agents adapt their strategies by imitating the most successful strategies of their own in-group. Uh, so, these are kind of the way you kind of have this evolutionary explanation of where, where, you, where the norms uh, stabilize. Now, there are two possible effects in, in this games um, that, that kind of enhance unfairness, popularized by, by an author, uh, Kaylin O'Connor, in a wonderful book, or The Origin of Unfairness. So one effect that you can see where unfairness kind of emerges even more is what is called the bargaining power effect. Namely, if one group has a higher disagreement point than another, then the equity is no longer the outcome that is expected. And discrimination arises because one group systematically bids high and the other accommodates and kind of bids low. It's kind of a safer, a safer, more modest bid. And, and they stabilize in that equilibrium. This asymmetric um, kind of stabilizes in this age and low unfair norm in which agents have no incentive to change. And that's how we just stuck in unfairness. And a similar outcome is what is known as the Ritkin effect. Um, this is when basically one group is larger than another. And so they might have equal disagreement point to start with, but 
Because the minority group, the smaller group, learns to concede resource to the majority because the minority members interact more often with the majority members, um, they simply adapt quicker to making low but, but safe bids, regardless of what the majority members do. So once this occurs, the majority slowly learns to bid disproportionate, to bid higher, uh, disproportionate getting a disproportionate resources uh, from the minority. And so we call it Red King effect because the fast evolving strategies yield secure payoffs in the short term, but there are disadvantages in the long term. And here is just quickly a graph where you can see the two, the two uh, effects here, the bargaining power were basically um, that the blues are kind of learning from the beginning to sort of kind of, you know, they start with medium and then they learn that they can get away with higher bids and that is what stabilizes. So that's you, what you have a society that is divided between, let's say, blues who take more, more resources than the reds and kind of a similar effect is, is on the other side with the majority minority effect. So, um, I have described um, that I also work with, you know, with, with the game theorist, and this is the kind of uh, the, the, the sort of the arguments that we're looking at, how precisely oppressive social arrangements can come about. And I also look at some kind of conditions under which we can mitigate this, this effect of unfairness. But this leads me to my final uh, problem, namely that some of the effects of conversations persist beyond the duration of the conversation. For example, in the case of slurring words, if someone targets you with an oppressive slurs, you'll clearly take the feeling of hurt um, beyond the conversation, but also there's something more, it's sort of an undermined social standing that you have, or perhaps people who have witnessed that interaction may continue to treat you in the way that a bigot would have treated uh, you in future interaction. So the question is, how does this happen? Um, I'm going to give you two examples. This one is the first, the locker room uh, talk. Uh, so this is an example from Mary Kay McGowan, um, uh, where you have uh, John saying, oh, how did he go last night? I banged that bee. Uh, and you know, you can imagine continuing John smiling, oh, does she have a sister? So what you have here, that clearly immediate effects um, where the two men are bonding, building a group solidarity, identity, but also their speech makes it conversationally appropriate to use degrading terms for women, even if women are not present. Um, and so this kind of, um, of, of example raises a new puzzle. It has long-term effects beyond the conversation. Imagine later on that John is, um, after having had his conversation with, with Steve, he might then infer, oh, you know, uh, Sue is an easy prey, or, and then he meets the second day, uh, Sue, and he might think, uh, maybe she'll have sex with me. So this is the first conversation has an effect on the second conversation. And you might imagine these kind of um, conversations kind of perpetuating and, and kind of um, with, with other people who weren't necessarily present in the first conversation. So the harms from the first conversation trickle down into subsequent conversations so that over time, it just feels more natural to, re to treat women with less respect. Um, and the question is like, how is this explained? The answer is that the slur used here doesn't just assign a conversational role within the limits and the duration of the conversation, but it's a social role about women that leaks out of that very specific interaction into social, wider, wider social interactions. Uh, and they do this by changing the beliefs and attitudes of other people. Here, Joan, uh, about the social role that Sue has. Um, so the long-term social effects, or what we call norm shifting, how norms slowly change in society, they occur because of the things that we say. And finally, it is important to think about why we say the things that we do. And here's another example from um, very familiar uh, when Trump is addressing um, um, uh, or talking about the, the news media as being the enemy of the American people. So what's going on here is that Trump seeks to disable the media as a mechanism of scrutiny. And he does so by putting the media into a social role, namely that of an enemy, 
Uh, that means that people will not believe media reports of his behavior. So in other words, he puts the media into a social role that silences it, and um, which brings him to sort of, uh, he, he helps uh, um, electoral reward. But what he aims to do here is to establish that you need to use a set of norms as when we're dealing, you're dealing with enemies. Namely, uh, you don't trust what they say, you don't trust their motives, or you might take even actions against them. So that also affects the way we um, kind of, uh, uh, the ways that we interact with people who think differently than you do. You might see evidence, for example, that um, when John is meeting uh, Sue and she says, I've read that there's a lie about Trump, and, and John is thinking and praying, oh, she might be duped. So that's kind of a variety of ways in which kind of we have wider consequences from, from the words that we, we use. And now, just a quick final word about how norms might change in a society at a given time. Um, so in a non-bigoted society, the costs for displaying bigotry, you might think, must outweigh the payoffs. Um, and yet, there must be payoffs for such behavior to be appealing at all. That's kind of during periods of change, like as we've seen with kind of the Trump and the, the, the language that he unleashed, um, either the perceived payoffs for the displaying of bigotry must rise, and people kind of become more and more confident that they can do so without uh, social repercussions, or the, the cost must fall. So basically, by reducing the costs for transgressing the norms of fairness and, and decency, the private expression of bigotry is encouraged to become public and, in a sense, legitimating it. So just to wrap up, um, we've seen several elements of human behavior, uh, social uh, and conversational, the cause oppression, and this includes the beliefs that we have about the social roles of others, the speech acts that we perform, and the rewards that we hope to get on, and, and perhaps other, other ingredients. So in trying to piece together a complete theory of what is going on in oppressive speech and oppressive societies, um, I'm just asking the question, what are the elements we might, might we missing? Um, and my answer is captured in this slide. Um, literally, I call, it, I call this theory the bears. Uh, I don't mean the literal, uh, the literal bears, but it's just a mnemonic uh, for the many elements that, that it includes, and that, that, that concerns um, so beliefs and expectations that we have about other people we're interacting with. We have evaluations, namely the norms and the attitudes towards others. And an important, very important one is allegiances that we kind of alluded a little bit. That matters uh, when, we kind of, um, when we kind of decide who do we want to be loyal, what sort of kind of uh, group signaling we want to signal, uh, and, um, and, and kind of that kind of sense that sometimes being part of a group is more important than even uh, truth-based or evidence-based beliefs uh, because uh, you want to be seen as part of a particular group. Um, and then we've seen roles. Uh, so those are the ways of indexing norms, beliefs, and attitudes. And we've quickly alluded to rewards, the incentives for acting. And also, you might think that, I mean, I was talking about words, but you might think more generally about signaling so it's like sending a message uh, that can be linguistic or it can be non-linguistic. So for example, dressing in a particular at attire or um, you know, um, imagine a, a man talking at, at a kind of at a, at a meeting and being with a tie and everything else. So whatever he says is, is kind of perceived as having more value um, than what, what women, the points that women might make. So, so I want to keep a more broad idea of signaling um, that, that is doing the work. So to conclude, um, I tried to explain what hate speech is by looking at a particular kind of hate speech, a slur, and to explain what a slur is doing and how it works. I've also tried to hint at work um, uh, that I do to model um, uh, why societies have oppressed groups in the first place. I do this with game theorists. And finally, how the things that we say also contribute to oppression and reinforce, um, reinforce oppressive uh, practices and, and norms. So the conclusion is that if we want to combat hate speech, uh, we first have to understand how it works. 
Uh, and I, I'm hoping that um, at least this has been thought-provoking for you, and I look forward to a fruitful conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, over to you for questions. Yes, go ahead. Yes, it is. Um, and that you use the example of Boris Johnson. Now, I'm sure I have no insight into his brain, but uh, I'm sure he would not consider what he said hateful or, or indeed on a personal level that he would even consider being uh, hateful. Now, the point I'm getting to is there seems to be a rise in the deliberate use <laughs> of some of the things you mentioned at the end, which is dragging us back from, from any progress in that area. So uh, how do you think you can combat that use by people in power right. to use the very things you're talking about to bring the back to a position they want purely to keep in power it's not it's, not, it's a power play isn't it the use of those tools you mentioned as a power play Excuse me. <laughs> um, so maybe i'm completely no, wrong it's, now. It, you think it completely no it's, it's totally on the point because i think indeed um it's as if like we change our sensitivity to the kind of language. So we might, I mean, especially like when it comes to, to legal recommendations, measurements with like with the online safety bill and things like that, we kind of want a very precise definition of what hate speech is, you know? And do we indeed, do we include the description, a metaphorical description that Muslims are, are like uh, letterboxes in that category or not? Um, and it's very hard to, to kind of delineate that. So you have a kind of definitional problem, a linguistic problem, what exactly falls in and falls out. But I think what matters is the effect that it creates. It harms, nonetheless, even if you don't use the most oppressive, uh, you know, the, 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 the highest, the most offensive um, uh, slur, uh, it, it still has similar effects of kind of excluding uh, and uh, excluding a particular portion of the society as, as kind of having equal, you know, equal social standing and that they deserve equal moral respect and things like that. Um, but the language indeed, is, um, it depends on the kind of, as it were, uh, at what stage the society is at and what the state of the norms are. So we were already, I think, with Trump and indeed with this kind of language that came with Brexit, uh, that people kind of felt more, more kind of, as it were, liberated or unleashed to say, to say what they were thinking privately, you know, and writing graffiti, packies out, and things like that. That's the kind of, it's the first exit, the valve of kind of unleashing all this, you know, it's a mix of things, hatred, contempt, or are you just kind of afraid for your own resources or fear. Things like that, the psychological motives might be very difficult, but what it creates, it creates a climate, an environment in which saying negative things is permissible. It's, you know, you, you shouldn't expect being penalized or losing your job or, um, and, and moreover, being in a position of power is like being at the center of a network. You just have so much of a, like your message gets across, uh, it reaches out so many people. And I think it's that kind of um, click as to, whoops, this thing is now permissible. Even Boris Johnson is using negative things. I can go out on the street and, and, and say my thing. <laughs> so it's, it's the environment. It's kind of adding a new, like turning a new notch that it's, it's okay and you can get away with. Um, is that responsive? Yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, kind of wondering how can we get, how can we get our uh, oh. beloved leaders to behave like adults? Yeah. And actually, yeah. That lady described and actually, you were right, because in a way, the, the fact that they, as it were, it's not um, a clear cut case of hate speech. You're totally right. That kind of makes it, um, that kind of gives them what we call a plausible deniability. You can always kind of go back and say, I really didn't mean it, or I didn't really intend all these harms that you people, you know, or it's like, oh, you're too touchy, getting too much offense and things like that. So then it's kind of, um, it, he's offering himself a, a way out. I'm just wondering if you've done any work between the hate, mm. hate and class. 
So you tend to think that the people who are actually on the power has the education, and the education actually lead, you know, has a better education, so they be not better, and they use the word more wisely. But have you done this relationship that if somebody who actually develop themselves from a class level, do they actually change the behavior of a hate speech and class, social class? Right. I mean, clearly those, um, that's an interesting one. Um, hate speech usually kind of is, is addressed to people based on their group membership. You might think that indeed class is a, is a way of kind of grouping people. Um, it's sort of, yeah, a different, a different kind of dimensions of creating a, a hierarchy. And, and typically they would kind of also overlap in the same way that kind of gender and race can overlap or any other kind of axis of hierarchy can, can uh, be compounded as it were. Um, now your question is that what is the class saying or what exactly? Yeah. So in terms of the social class, you got the um, top earning people, pay well, uh -huh. that's what I mean. and also the more like um, maybe um, people who has much more privilege. Let's talk about this white privilege as well. Okay, and uh, is there any relationship between they feel that if they are, you, you see what I'm thinking of, so they feel it's, it's okay, I can't speak about it because I have this privilege and I have this power and I'm on the top level, so I, it's okay, oh, I right. use that word. Whereas when people actually maybe are be at the lower ah, class or I working see. class level, and I see those hate speech in all different level, right? So. I don't actually think there is any... Um... So it's as if you're, you're thinking about the sort of responsibility or accountability that we have depending on, when using hate speech, depending on the, the as we're social hierarchy, the yeah, class that we are in. Yeah, this sort okay. of a relationship. Have you done any study and the saying people on the higher class or having a better education. Mm -hmm. And that they don't and have to appeal to using hate speech because in a sense yeah. they kind of get the goods without having to put someone down yeah. through language. Yes, yes, that is a very interesting point. Because kind of, I don't know if empirically, I haven't run myself um, studies, but you might think that indeed, who exactly is using this kind of language? You know, does does Boris Johnson have a have have anything at stake of kind of using this this invectives and, and you know he would be out or he would draw condemnation or he there will be sanctions yeah so being as it were at the center you know an influencer or we're having a sort of power um, either political social or any other form um, uh, it's as if like you have already that power. If my argument is that in a way what slurs are doing is that is the kind of this attempt of grabbing power. So that's kind of something that you feel like you don't have, but you ought to have. You're kind of entitled to that in virtue of your group membership, like it's being, you know, um, a, a white person or a man or where someone powerful. Um, so typically what happens, and you might have seen this, is, is you know, people at the corner of the street who may have been indeed at the at the bottom of society, as it were, that kind of use this kind of language as a way of sort of um, claiming back the power that they feel that they don't have in virtue of their group membership. Being white, they might also kind of feel that they, they are, you know, missing out on so many things. The society has changed so much than, you know, in the times of their parents and so on, and they feel like they, they, they're missing things that they ought to have, and perhaps, who knows, in their sort of uh, reasoning and psychology, it's, it's kind of this thing, the kind of the scapegoating is like, it's because of them that I don't have all the goods and perks that my group membership ought to kind of, uh, I ought to be entitled. 
So there is that kind of um, that kind of dynamics, and it's interesting that people being at the top of the hierarchy, they don't need to appeal to this strategy because they've got everything in terms of material, economic, uh, social capital, and things like that. So the language would be quite as a word, a, a, I don't know what the word is like, you don't need to do that because you've got it all. Um, so this kind of language is a sort of, um, um, I don't know, a way of trying to rebalance what you think that the goods that you ought to have and you don't have, and, and the language is kind of a, a desperate way of seeking power back. Being able to be in that powerful position and telling other people what to do, or you know, excluding them from the goods that you think only you are entitled, um, and, and things like that. That might be one psychological explanation. Okay, great. Did, did you have a question, by the way, right at the beginning? Yes, so let's have you, and then I saw you, yeah. Uh, so, in the talk, you uh, casually equated offense and harm, and uh, we're still talking about harm as a particular um, like negative effect. Um, and I think you explained that Jay Austin's performative utterances really clearly as, as how they have their effect. Um, but one common rejoinder to um, uh, complaints about hate speech uh, is the oh, there's no harm, and in particular mm -hmm. in terms of like uh, cancel culture type yeah. uh, requests to take someone's job away because they have made, uh, used hate speech online. Uh, people justify that um, material harm to the speaker um, of lo the job loss. Um, they justify that by saying, oh, they caused the harm by their speech. Um, and then people come to the defense of that speech by saying there, there is no harm, offense is not harm. Um, and like I say, you, you exp explain the effect, but when people say harm, they mean often material harm. And like, I see, I see people struggle to make the equation that you just did. Um, and so like, my question is like, how would you uh, respond to that if this, mm -hmm. this idea of uh, that is not a real harm, offense is not harm? Mm -hmm. um, in particular, because you mentioned that audience preference is one of the the means of um, by which it has its effect. Like if someone is more or less offended by it, um, someone can choose to not receive the harm. You know. Right. Um, I mean, clearly, I mean that there is obviously um, <laughs> different ends from different people. So in a way, w what I care to, to really emphasize is that slurs don't just cause offense. It's not, a, just a, it's not just an insult. It's not a matter of kind of being addressed with a pejorative and then I, you know, rightly or wrongly. Um, it's really, it, it kind of concerns all the members of that group. And there is no grounding, as it were, for that negative expression of, uh, of, of contempt or, or, or hate or everything else that could, could go. But apart from that, it's, I think the harm is really more profound in the sense that it has consequences in society. It ends up subordinating people. It kind of keeps them away, you know. It has this kind of exclusionary marginalizing, the fact that when I kind of, as it were, as a bigot, I kind of take on this dominant role, and I, that's, then I kind of dictate the rules of the game. I say, okay, we're not equal anymore. You're not gonna get to say what you want to say. Or I may misinterpret willfully or uh, whatever you say and then treat you as if you're unworthy. <laughs> or, 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 it's like you're not, you know, it can be even more dehumanizing than obviously depending on the cases and things like that. Or, or, or think of the misogynistic uh, speech and so on. Um, as if like, yeah, you're not seen as an equal human being. So in that sense, I mean, there is another co perhaps complication also because we talk about harms directly 
when we think about the, the targets that are at the, at the other end of the, 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 the hate speech. But also, you might ask the question, what happens to the bystanders who just happen to be there and hear um, uh, uh, slurs being hurled on a, on a, on a, on a, um, in a bus or, or, or on the metro and things like that? What do you do? You know, do you kind of, um, you know, you might, you might say, gosh, it's absolutely wrong, uh, and yet, not many people go and step up. They kind of, we tend to keep silent and thereby kind of appear as if like we're complicit with what is going on with this kind of, um, as it were, power imbalance that is established in the, in the conversation. Um, and, and so you may think again, you know, maybe the bystanders are the one who are offended, are offended that this kind of language is left standing, is permissible and it shouldn't. Um, but, but I think, and then you were talking about, perhaps we should think about more kind of serious harm, not just psychological, but material. And this is where, this is the kind of the, the work that I was hinting at with, with the game theory. Having this kind of division between two groups, and interestingly, even just the mere division of the groups, the agents just learn such that uh, one group ends up with more resources, making higher, more aggressive bids than the other one, and the other one just accommodates. So you get in, as it were, uh, discrimination or unfairness at, with this minimal condition. Then if you add that one group is more powerful than the other because they have this fallback position, then again, that's a very material sense in which one group is harmed, you might think, materially, because they get less. Um, and nevertheless, they kind of, they, they, as we're stabilized in that, in that norm, in that equilibrium. That's also very <laughs> interesting, like, why don't we rebel? Why don't, why, why do we accept to, to, uh, that kind of low bid because it's kind of rational for you to accept a little bit more than nothing? So it's as <laughs> like we are our own kind of victims. One way to do it is to sort of, um, kind of the, 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 to, to break the bargaining and say a bit like the ultimatum games in which if someone finds a 10 pounds note and then they offer you uh, when they try to divide it and they say like, oh yeah, 50p for you. I keep the rest, thank you. And uh, you know, it feels rational for you to accept the 50p, but yet uh, it is not. <laughs> that person is gonna get more of the resource than you. So, um, so it feels like we kind of end up in this unjust social arrangements in virtue of, of the kind of decisions that we make, the strategies that we make, the learning that we make from, from kind of from our earning group. So in that sense, that is a material harm. The society just emerges towards that direction and we, we stabilize in those, um, those unfair, unfair division of, 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 the, of, of the goods. Um, but then I think what matters for me in a way is, is the social harm, because in addition to the very psychological effects that you have on the on the on the here on the on the targets, you know, the point that they're intimidated, they're silenced, they don't dare to say anything, it's the social standing that you basically present those group in a way, misrepresent those groups as not worthy of an equal treatment, and in that sense, you kind of undermine their social standing. You just think like, oh, there are other kind of, you know, they're not people like us. Um, and also that has also other consequences in that it sort of creates this division between us and them and the sort of perception that they are different where that they are like, oh, I don't even want to interact with them. Or it's, it's the, and that, that is a serious harm. Great, thank you. Okay, lady over here. Oh, lots of hands. All right, so. Um, keep your hands up so I can see you. You go first. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mihela, for um, you know sharing with us what hate speech is, how it works, and the different ways in which it's perpetrated. My question for you really is, are you or any of your peers working on um, the ways in which you know that balance of power can be rebalanced or neutralized when that arises? Because if we, if we take the example of the video you shared, um, at the point where that social 
you know, status was introduced, the respect was, or the, the rebalance yeah. happened because there was a respect for that social status due to mutual understanding, that person being a member of that group. But yeah. it doesn't always happen that way in certain situations, like if I was at work and my boss, you know, said something, I was in a meeting, and I was made to feel as though I didn't have a place there. Um, and it is true that sometimes people don't speak up, but if you did want to speak up, is anyone looking into the different ways in which you could do it in a way that is, you know, rebalances the power in a, in a way that empowers the person being undermined rather than, you know, creating a circumstance that may be emotional? Because it is emotional for anybody who's been oppressed, right? Totally. So I'm just wondering if there is research on that. Oh, yes. That is a wonderful question. Really, really uh, great and at the heart of, in a way, what to do next. Um, what, what are the, the, the mechanisms to undo this? And, um, and, and there are also kind of different strands. So, um, and, and I did do work on reclamation. So, because you, you might think that you can reestablish the power, uh, like as a, as a way of kind of empowering the group by just kind of, um, as you were, yeah, adopting the slur word, the very slur word, as a, as a word of empowerment and, and, and sort of create, as it were, a way of kind of taking the word from the bigot, <laughs> Mouse, because he coined it, and, and sort of saying, I'm going to infuse a different meaning that kind of, and, and you create a new practice, basically, because it, it, they have to kind of come hand in hand together, the practice involving the people, getting the social movement, and also kind of reaching out to many other people. So you have this kind of reclamation or empowerment within the group. Then the other more critical one, in a way, and the reason why I think that reclamation, it's a precarious project, because you might think like, okay, we succeeded within our own group, we managed to kind of sanitize this word to make it mean something positive of which we're proud. And yet, that word is still there in the kind of broader social currency, as it were, with still the meaning of, of a very kind of powerful slur. And the question is like, yeah, how, how do you kind of perpetuate that new practice to become, as it were, pervasive to the new society in the way we have with, with the word queer? So nowadays, you can kind of say it, okay, we have queer studies, and it just, it's, it's a positive. It, you know, but still, that doesn't mean that when a bigot is using the word, there isn't kind of the risk that they use it with contempt, with uh, to do all these this negative things, um, to put someone down, and things like that. So in a way, this is where work needs to be done, as to what exactly are the mechanisms of, of um, as we're restoring <laughs> justice and restoring the balance, the power balance. And here is work where we look at um, um, blocking, for instance, or more, more broadly, we, we, we think of this like the contra speech. Sort of we, you know, we have a contour, <laughs> as, as kind of Louis Brandeis, he says, fight fire with fire. You have to have more speech to develop and kind of speak up to the bigot. But there are a whole host of questions like who should speak up in what situations? There are always costs for, indeed, being in a sort of an institutional power imbalance. You know, yes, I would love to speak up, but, um, you know, Am I sure that I will have the job tomorrow? Who knows? And it's, it's all those calculation of costs that we have to make at each, uh, you know, at each move that we make or each interactions that we're at. Uh, but that's one way. And the question then also arises is like, who should do the speaking? Like, am I as the target? Speak up to the bigot? Uh, will, will I be successful? What if, you know, there's a threat of escalation and I end up, you know, there's always with slurs or hate speech, there's the potential for violence. And you can never predict how it will end up. Um, but then um, I think what matters is also is like the question is like, should, should perhaps people from the dominant group that are sympathizers to the target, uh, is it them who should speak up? And will they have more force and be more effective? And the way that we kind of it happened with the civil arts movement, like if it wasn't for, for the um, kind of the, the whites who kind of took decision because they had power, basically to change the, the worldview of the of the kind of climate in that period. So you need that kind of balance. But also, what's interesting, a very beautiful distinction that I, I learned from um, uh, uh, a sociologist actually, James Scott, 
who talks about the fact that targets clearly, they speak up, but within what he calls a hidden transcript, within, as it were, a, 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 a record, a score, let's say, uh, where that keeps track only of their conversations within the group. Because, in a way, that's the fear. You never quite dare to speak up truth to the power, or you have to kind of muster the courage to really find that moment when you're going to <laughs> put down. Um, and then, and then, and then uh, the, the other part of the, this transcript, so we have the hidden part within the in-group, and then you have the public transcript, where it's, it's that that matters, that, that will change the, the status of the, com the, the larger, broader conversation, as you were, in a society. And that's where it's, it's, it, it's hard to, to kind of navigate. But in terms of the very linguistic kind of mechanisms, one way is the sort of what we call blocking, as it were, you challenge certain presupposition of the come packed into the a slurring act. Namely, when you, when, you, when you slur as a bigot, you kind of um, assume this dominant position. People want to talk in terms of authority. I like to talk in terms of power, sort of position yourself in a position of power. And then as, as the, the recipient or perhaps a bystander, you can say, what's your language? Or who do you think you are? Or various other ways of kind of blocking and saying, I'm not going to let this stand. So you can think um, that is wrong or ways of kind of really, um, as you were, hindering this process that we're talking about of accommodation. You know, we always accommodate if we don't do anything, if we don't uh, raise the question, wait a minute, I don't agree with this. If we don't do that, it just goes on um, as if it's, if it's tacitly agreed upon or acceptable and things like that. So we need to kind of um, block the accommodation and typically by kind of challenging the, 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 the power position that the speaker is taking or kind of trying to get others involved uh, or other ways are sort of, of kind of trying to bend the language as if like, because you don't want to backfire because there are cases where you kind of you challenge and then perhaps the bigot is on his, on his feet and then he replies back. And then it's like, again, you haven't succeeded. Um, and so you have to have another reply ready. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and that's why it's kind of very uh, precarious, but you can do it. And also what matters in a way is that there's never a way of kind of totally undoing the harm. You know, that has happened. There is that kind of a residual, you know, all the psychological, everybody has heard it. <laughs> you can't, as, as one of mine, Rob Simpson says, you can't undo the, uh, what is it? You can't unring the bell. <laughs> Once it rang, you cannot not hear it. Uh, but what you can do by blocking uh, those moves is to basically alter how the conversation will go forward. You know, you can't erase the bad, but you can at least establish a new slate and sort of like, okay, from now on, we're on a different power balance. Okay, I'm going to take three different questions all at once. So first of all, the chap with the beard. Right, so my question's about words like gammon. Mm -hmm. so words that are intended to be offensive but are directed towards people ah. with the power. And there are people who would want to say that gammon is a racist term of hate speech and I think that's obviously nonsense and I think your theory gives a good explanation of why that's nonsense because of the power relationship of of the person saying it against the person it's being said against yeah but one implication of your theory might be because of the way in which offensive terms can claim power and reclaim power but actually it's a positive thing to do to say gammon because it's a move to take power away from those who shouldn't have it and rebalance it in favor of inequality. So you might say an implication of your theory is that words like gammon are good things to say, but there's also the risk. You talked about the environment in which discourse is coarsened and people yeah. like Boris Johnson can get away with calling Muslim women letterboxes. There's a risk that by legitimizing offensive terms, um, it legitimizes all offensive terms, not just, not, yeah. you know, not just ones that your theory wouldn't consider hate speech. So my question is, I mean, I think it's fine to call people gammon actually, but my question is, 
how you would square that, the idea that it might be an implication of your theory that gammon is a positive thing to say, and we all should be saying it to rebalance power against the risk that a move like that would course in discourse generally and allow other offensive hate speech in. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your presentation. So my question is uh, whether we can expect the kind of war without the hate speech. So the Iran, the hate speech is from a kind of a, uh, power, kind of difference of powers. And uh, the power is from kind of a, from groups and from a kind of perception from historical ones. And maybe in, in theory, maybe there, there is a kind of a perfect power balance, but the in, in reality, I don't expect the kind of a, how can I say, perfect power balance. So maybe an, in a kind of long term, one group has a power and the, the other group has a power in the future or something. So my question is, can we expect the um, war without the head speech? And uh, if not, how, how can we uh, address the, the kind of uh, the issues? Thank you very much. And then directly behind you. Thanks. Thanks for the very thought-provoking speech um, and presentation. Um, mine, I just have a couple of questions. Um, one's maybe more under terms of identity and the identities that we maybe take into our speeches. Um, you mentioned interchangeable things such as a teacher, maybe being a mother at home. Uh, is there maybe a discouragement for some fields to take in some identities? So for example, maybe a politician that's a female not taking in maybe a nurturing stance, um, which may come to end more naturally because she doesn't want to be perceived as weak, maybe. And the other part of my question was on the power differentials. Um, what is more advantageous to someone who wants to perpetuate hate speech? Is it if they take from someone who's very powerful or if they take all the power from someone who has very little? So that would, that would be my question. Okay, so... Um Hate speech against the powerful and the risk of coarsening public discourse. What happens, could, could we have a world without hate speech given the inevitability of power imbalances <coughs> and the relationship between power differentials once again and identities and hate speech? Right, let me <laughs> see if I can remember. Um, so uh, this is a very interesting point, um, the kind of slurs against the powerful. And, and clearly, kind of technically, they count as slurs, even though there is a different kind of offense or harm going on. Um, and that's why I like to think of, of, of slurs in terms of uh, this spectrum. Uh, that's something, uh, and also this kind of a, a new kind of word that, that emerge as a way of um, kind of expressing a way of, of um, kind of, yeah, taking power back as a way of kind of making them, not necessarily subordinate here, but, but kind of put them in the place or things like that. Um, so we're kind of punch up. <laughs> uh, so it's interesting because, um, and this is where I want to bring in the idea of variable offense, um, in the sense that, um, as I said, words like limey or, or things that are addressed to, um, to a powerful group, they won't have the same the same degree of harm or offense in the same way the, the N-word has or the C-word. So that we need to kind of keep in mind. And also, it's also telling what are the conditions that need to be in place in order to explain this variety, the degree. Um, and, and here the idea is, is precisely that a slur counts as, as very kind of oppressive when precisely you have that power imbalance between the, the, the two, uh, the, the roles that kind of come with the speaker and the target. Um, and here clearly you are as a sort of in a, in a lower, lower, low power role as it were, um, you are trying to, 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 to address someone who has already all the power, kind of coming to that, that question. And it feels like a sort of ineffective way because the powerful can always kind of say, oh, okay, and so what? <laughs> it's not gonna do anything to me because they are already in that powerful position. They have all the good and perks. Uh, and, and kind of this, this rhetoric move that you're trying to do with a slur, it's not, as it were, giving you any, anything extra. But then 
And then, so for me, in a way, those kind of, I wonder if they work more a little bit um, like the normal pejoratives. So also, I'm thinking, and like, this, this broad category of insults or pejoratives as a sort of then um, sliding into uh, you know, a borderline with, with the slurs. So pejoratives that you address typically uh, to people based on their property, personal properties, as it were, you know, calling someone a jerk or things like that. Um, there is no group membership of, of, um, of uh, like, let's say, the group of jerks. <laughs> Um, but slurs and contrast have to have that kind of group um, condition. And, and that's kind of the, the reason why your offense is kind of <laughs> locked in. And then, um, so it's a little bit harder to sort of, yeah, try to have a very powerful slur to, towards a powerful group. So th there's that element, precisely in a way because of the existing power relationship between the, the two groups. Um, so that's one way um, um, sort of I'm thinking, sort of the kind of, uh, perhaps they work like, like pejoratives. You know, you might have kind of pejoratives based on a group membership, what I'm thinking. Um, 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 yeah, so that's, that's kind of one way to explain this, given the, the spectrum of the slurs and the dynamics that need to be in place. Uh, precisely, a slur will have extraordinary power when it piggybacks on an existing power imbalance. When that isn't in place, it's as if like you have to recreate it. You, you, know, you have to, to, to get people to acknowledge it that it is a, is a reasonable way to, to exactly talk to the powerful in that way. Uh, they deserve, um, as it were, contempt and all the negative things. How about the inevitability of power imbalances? Why don't you? Because we're running a weeny bit short of time. Uh, I'm always kind of thinking that, indeed, this kind of language has its, its currency, as it were, its power, because we have that power imbalance in the, in the social world. If that didn't exist, imagine a world in which we kind of men and women are equal, and all the kind of um, the, the people that are currently, um, as it were, targeted, you know, vulnerable groups in need of protection and so on, based on their group membership. If we didn't have that in place as a kind of as a social practice, then the language wouldn't have any any way of kind of um, locking in into it and making it as if keeping it alive. So the language, if we were into an equal world, the, that kind of language would simply fall flat. And kind of in the way we kind of, you know, we have those past slurs as it were, it's like, okay, that was a time back then when it existed, that power imbalance, and the word was locked into that power imbalance in the real world, in the social world. Um, once you kind of dissociate those two, because the world is not reflecting, is, it doesn't have that power imbalance anymore, then the language wouldn't have, would, wouldn't have a currency. Uh, that would be the ideal world, actually. Do work to eliminate the very, um, as it were, inequality, discrimination, and things like that. And this kind of language would be like, what? <laughs> OK, thank you. And then the third question at the back, which I, as if I understood you rightly, you were saying it's riskier for people in low power groups to complain about uh, hate speech, is that right? Because they're exposing a power differential which places them at a disadvantage? Yes. Um, pertaining to the power differentials, um, so I think the thing we spoke about, the teacher who may be a, f a female or maybe a politician, maybe we've seen it in recent times where there's a, a move for a female to use harsher language just to kind of come across that bit more assertive, that more aggressive, and to maybe solidify her position in maybe a politician, political arena. And I think like the second part of what I was asking was about who's take, who, where's the advantage? Is it taken away from someone who's got nothing, or if it's taken away from someone who's got a lot? So the way I'm thinking is that indeed this language is already addressed to people who are already at a disadvantage, a significant disproportionate disadvantage. So I think adding the language on top of the 
the very kind of inequality, you know, material, economic, and, and, and social. Uh, frankly, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, in a way, reinforcing. It's kind of making it as if like, oh, this is the, the, the natural world, the sort of the world, the way the world is, is carved up. As if like, I'm in this group, I should have more. And you're in this group, you all, you know, you, there's no expectation for you to, 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 to as it were, come up. Um, so as opposed to perhaps the other way, kind of coming back to the, to the, the, the slurs addressed to the powerful, in a way that, that is a sort of a, a way of kind of Restoring justice um, via, in a way, coining these new words, and what you need, in a way, is again the kind of the social, the social structure behind that. You need that to become, um, as it were, um, a, a normal practice in which, yes, the powerful deserves to, <laughs> to be, you know, seen as as lower, where taken away the power that they have and things like that. Um, but, but it's, it's this kind of growth, a very organic growth between the social, the social practice, the, the interactions in which we use these words, and the way the words kind of conventionalize to have this particular meaning. And sort of the way that kind of it becomes as if like it's just as legitimate and things like that. But you need it both kind of, it's a sort of this feedback loop between what we do or fail to do with language and and the very social structures and norms that are in place that enable that language, and then what we do or fail with the language again comes back and reinforces. So you always have that kind of feedback loop, and that's basically what explains why these oppressive norms persist and, and endure over time. One more then, but please keep it quick and keep the answer um, quick too. Yeah. Um, I like the choice of Boris Johnson, actually. I think he's got a, a long history of um, not just racist, but uh, homophobic and sexist language, both um, spoken and written, um, although he's obviously not as coarse as Donald Trump. Um, what concerns me um, is that the likes of Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, and um, influencers like Andrew Tate have been extremely successful um, in acquiring additional power and influence and wealth uh, using hate speech and divisive language and populist language. Yes. And, uh, I, it worries me that uh, other populist politicians and social media influencers will, will will see the success and power and wealth which they've garnered and will and will will, will simply uh, see this as a, as good tactics and strategies and, and copy that. Yes. And I don't I don't know how how we we get around that uh, exactly. issue. Exactly, exactly. That that is the real problem in a way that we're facing nowadays because they have such a as you were, power, which is even by the mere fact of having so many connections to people, and also the fact that they can do things, you know, and getting away with. Um, um, but yeah, what matters for me in a way is that they unleash this rage and, and kind of anger in people that they may feel that privately, but they never dare to go publicly because of social costs and things like that. So we, they kind of set an example but also, as you say, because of their very wide uh, and tight connections to, to a variety of people, um, there's, there's rich, there is speed in their, in their, in their, resort, in their messages, and, and there is a potential of recruiting, in a way. So in a way, the reason why I think that, um, that the slurs are about this kind of power grab is that if you think as a sort of uh, you know susceptible or impressionable person that kind of doesn't quite have a good uh, you know political opinion or critical analysis and things like that, and you think like, wow, look at him, look at the the sort of the goods and perks that he's getting, the sort of the incentive for power, then is that's what is uh, can be a sort of a, a, a copying, <laughs> imitating strategies because if you think like. If he's getting that power with that kind of language, that's what I'm going to do myself, and um, and and that's where I see in a way the danger, and in particular the social media is making that even worse by the mere amplification and the and, and the fact that um, you know you see a, a critical mass of people uh, kind of gathering together and and engaging in this kind of practice and language, you think like oh my god there are so many. Or you might think that you didn't make up your mind and you think like, what's, I, was, I used to think like that. Maybe I should join this group. <laughs> or, um, 
So it, that's the sort of the allegiance uh, dimension that I was that was making it, and and sort of the fact that we are kind of loyal to our group, basically to our tribe, that matters so much for us. Of having this sort of sense of belonging that kind of gives us a sense of identity, and that is is more important than you know, is it true or false, or is it right or wrong, things like that, and that is the the, the really worrying. Bit. And in a way, that's, I think the social media has such a huge responsibility um, in kind of permitting this kind of language. And by the sheer numbers and data and the sense of prevalence, it feels like that must be true. That must be the case, that this is, um, this, this is how society has moved on to this kind of more coarse uh, language and, and, and environment. And, you know, once we're stuck in that, it's very hard to kind of come back to sort of bring back norms of decency and fairness and, and, and things like that. And that's the real danger. Um, and I have no ideas in a way. I'm, I'm very much interested. I'm working on a project on incels at the moment. And I'm also interested in sort of thinking basically how we move from the online world to things that you might think, oh, it's just a conversing, you know, we're bantering, we're joking, this, like, uh, and that. But people, it doesn't take much to move from online to offline, to meet together, to sort of, uh, co you know, coordinate, organize, and this, what, in a way, what we've seen with Capitol Hill um, riots. Um, it's, it's that kind of sense that it's so easy to move from, from language to action. Um, and, and I don't know what the solution is, in a way, because also like thinking about the people working on the, um, the policymakers working on the uh, online safety bill, uh, you know, banning is also not necessarily the solution. We do want our right to free speech to be kind of in place, but it's always that kind of, where do we draw the boundary between what is harmful but legal uh, uh, versus what is really, you know, perhaps inciting to violence, glorifying violence and things like that, where it kind of, um, um, the, the, the kind of something has to be done, uh, otherwise we're like all loose. Um, so th those are really critical problems uh, ahead of us, and I wish that, uh, yeah, we have solutions in the near future. Well, I'm sorry to have to call things to a close on such a disquieting note, but uh, <laughs> we've reached time. Apologies to anybody whose questions I missed. Uh, thank you, as always, for your participation. And Michaela, thank you very much indeed for your talk. Thank you very much, Paul, for your questions. <laughs>